Well, if you would please turn in your Bible to Joel chapter 2. Joel 2. I want to thank Mike Andrus for filling in for me last week. It's a great Sunday together as a church. As a result, we skipped the passage that um, we would have covered last week, and so I've combined last week's passage in Joel with uh, the final passage in Joel as well. So we have a lot to cover this morning. Let me begin with a question. The book of Joel has been calling us to repentance for the first part, the first two sermons that we've covered. Very clearly, um, very, very boldly calling us to repentance. But let me ask, what motivates our repentance? Repentance is not an easy thing. We're called to turn from our life of sin, from the pleasures in this life, from um, the accolades that we may receive from others, to turn from all of that and to turn to God. This is not an easy task. And so what is it that motivates our repentance? In Joel, we see two overarching motivations for repentance. The first is God's warning of His coming judgment. But there is also a motivation which is the promise of God's blessing upon His people that repent. We come to a major turning point in the book of Joel this morning. Up until now, the Lord has been highlighting this judgment aspect, this judgment component of motivation. We've seen that this announcement of God's coming judgment is God's mercy, like a siren before the storm that is meant to lead us to seek shelter and to repent. Israel has already experienced a storm of locusts that devastated their land, which was a result of their sin against God. But God has also mentioned a future coming storm, what Joel calls the day of the Lord, the day when God's heavenly army will bring judgment upon all who do not seek shelter in God. The locust storm was meant to lead God's people to lament for their sin, and the coming storm of the day of the Lord is meant to lead God's people to repent of their sins. And this repentance is the only way to find shelter from the storm. So there's two motivations for repentance, negative and positive. Up until now, God has been using the negative. Those who don't repent of their sins will face God's judgment. But today, we get to focus on the blessings that come for those who repent. The blessings of repentance in this chapter, just to give a brief overview, um, you don't need to write these down, I just want you to see it. They involve or come in four stages. In verses 18 to 27, we see temporal material blessings following the disaster of the locust storm. And then secondly, the spiritual blessings that will come before the final disaster of judgment. The third stage in these blessings is the blessing of God's eternal judgment on the nations. We'll see when we get there how that's a blessing. And then finally, the eternal blessings that follow the final judgment. But in each of these stages of God's blessings, there is something that is overarching, a repeated motif that binds all of them together. And that is the blessing of God's presence. You could even say that all of these blessings of repentance could be summarized in this. The blessing of repentance is God's enduring presence. I want to show you this repeated motif before we dive into the four blessings. Notice at the end of the section on material blessings in verse 27. We read, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord, your God. The spiritual blessing section doesn't have a verse per se, but it's all about God's abiding presence through the pouring out of the Holy Spirit. 
At the end of the third section on judgment, we read this in verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. And the section on eternal blessings ends the same way. Verse 21. For the Lord dwells in Zion. Do you see this? The blessing, the overarching blessing, is God's presence, His enduring presence. When God made a covenant with His people, He promised that I will be your God and you shall be my people. God promised His people that He would dwell among them, that He would be present among them, relationally present among them, and that the blessings that were promised to the covenant people of God would be the overflow of God's abiding and enduring presence with them. He also told them that if they failed to keep His covenant, that He would remove His presence and He would remove these blessings. But even then, if they repented of their sins and turned back to God, He would restore the blessing of His presence. Restore the blessings that belong to the covenant people of God. So, as we walk through these four stages, the blessing of repentance, I want us to keep this overarching blessing in mind. God's enduring presence. All of the other blessings we should see as flowing out of His presence, of His relationship with His people. And that is the main motivation for repenting today and for living a life of repentance in the days to come. I'm not going to read this whole text. We're going to work through it in parts. Um, So keep your Bible open to Joel chapter 2 as we work together. Let's begin with the first blessing promised in verses 18 to 27 of chapter 2. This is what God promises. Those who repent will reap temporal material blessings. Following the locust plague, we're not told explicitly, but presumably the people of God that Joel was prophesying to repented as he had instructed them to do in chapter 2, verses 12 to 14, if you can look back there. They returned to the Lord, presumably, with their whole heart. They tore their hearts instead of their garments. Their repentance was real and internal. It wasn't simply an external show. And so the Lord promised to restore their material prosperity. And this is what we see in verses 18 to 27. But I want you to note that this is not a new promise. This is, in a sense, a reiteration of the promise God made with Israel when He established His covenant with them in the first place. In Deuteronomy 30, we read it like this. When you return to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, sounds very much like Joel 2, doesn't it? Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the work of your hands, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. God had promised this way before. Joel came and gave his prophecy. But now that very thing is happening. They have returned to the Lord, and so the Lord is returning their material prosperity that had been stripped by the plague of the locusts. In verse 25, we see a summary of this restoration of the land. He says, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. I'm going to restore the devastation of the locust plague. The land that had once been desolate, as verse 19 tells us, would now be full of grain and wine and oil. Verse 22, the pastures would now be green. Verse 23, the rain would now be restored. Do you get the picture? But when all of this happens, the Lord wants His people to know something critical. Look again at verse 27 that we read earlier. When all of this happens, you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel 
and that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else. These temporal material blessings that the Lord is restoring to Israel during the day of Joel are the fruit of his presence among his people. But there, these temporal blessings give way in verse 28 to future spiritual blessings that are beyond comparison to what the Lord did for Israel during the day of Joel. This is what we learn in these verses. Those who call upon the Lord will receive spiritual blessings. Why do I say spiritual blessings? Look at verse 28, the verse that heads off this section. God says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. So when is the afterward that Joel is speaking of here? This verse is quoted in Acts 2, and in Acts 2, the phrase afterward is translated in the last days. So the blessings, the spiritual blessings, the outpouring of the Spirit of God spoken of here in Joel 2.28 are what we would call eschatological blessings. The eschaton refers to last things. So these are the blessings that will come in the last days days. When are the last days? The last days are the days between Christ's first coming and his second coming. In the book of Acts, we get a picture of what the Jews expected during the last days after the Messiah came. They expected that all of the promised blessings spoken of in the prophets would come upon them all at once. But Jesus, in his teaching and even after his resurrection, began teaching his disciples that the blessings of the Messianic age would not come all at once. They would come to them in stages. In Acts 1, Jesus appears to the disciples. Greg Strand preached on this a few weeks ago. And what do they ask him? They say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They wanted to know if at that time the enemies of God would be dealt with and all of the blessings of the Messianic age would flow. Jesus, in short, says, no, that time is coming in the future and it's a time that only the Father knows. But it is coming. In the meantime, he says, there's some other things that need to take place. First of all, get ready He's saying to his apostles, the Spirit is going to come. He's going to pour out on you in power. And as the Spirit comes on you in power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Then, Jesus says, he will return in the way that he departed And all of the eschatological blessings that had been promised would come to fruition. So, the blessings, the eschatological last day's blessings will come in stages. And this prophecy in Joel 2, 28 to 32 is the beginning of these final blessings. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, Think for a moment of the significance of this line, of this promise. In the past, God's Spirit had been primarily given to a select group of people. For example, the Spirit comes upon the kings. The Spirit comes especially on the prophets like like Joel and, and like many others. Mainly on men, bear in mind. But now we are told that the blessings of the Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. That doesn't mean that everybody will receive the Spirit, but the Spirit will be given to all kinds of people without distinction to whoever believes in the name of the Lord Jesus. Joel says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on male and female 
servants in those days, I will pour out my Spirit. So do you see, regardless of any distinction, whether it is man or woman, whether it is young or old, whether it is slave or free, the promise of the coming Spirit is for all, for whoever believes on the name of the Lord Jesus. The blessings of the new covenant will reach far and wide. This prophecy is fulfilled in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost. If you'll recall from Acts 2, the apostles and many of Jesus' other disciples, about 120 of them, are gathered together. This group included men and women, young and old, maybe even slave and free. And as this group of 120 people are gathered on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit falls upon each of them and they begin speaking in tongues. They begin speaking in different languages. What are these different languages? This is an amazing picture. They are the languages of all of the Jews who had gathered to Jerusalem from the fe- for the feast from all over the entire Roman Empire. You have to keep in mind that as the Jews converge upon Jerusalem from the feast, all of them most likely would have spoken Hebrew as Jews. They would have spoken Aramaic, but as a second language, not as a primary language. Their primary language would have been the language from the country from which they came, from all of the ends of the Roman Empire. And so when the Spirit falls upon the apostles and Jesus' other disciples, and they start speaking, they are speaking the gospel to each person there in their native heart language. This is the fulfillment of the promised blessing in Joel 2. And do you know what happened? The people responded to the message that they heard through the power of the Holy Spirit at that time. After Peter preached a sermon, the people asked what they must do to be saved, and this is what Peter said to them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise, it is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to Himself. The people responded to this message. They received the Word, and they were, just like James will be in this next service, they were baptized. And on that day, 3,000 souls were added to the church of God. In Joel 2, verse 32, God says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. So on Pentecost, the Lord called 3,000 people to Himself. Acts 2 tells us that very explicitly. And in response to God's call upon them, they call upon the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are saved and they received the Holy Spirit of God. God now dwells not simply in temples and with special people, but God now dwells through His Holy Spirit in the hearts of everyone who is in Jesus Christ. What a blessing to know God personally and to have Him present even within us. So why should we repent of our sins and turn to the Lord? Because the promised spiritual blessings are for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Friends, the gift of the Holy Spirit, as Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, is simply a foretaste of all of those other blessings that have been spoken of in the prophets. The Holy Spirit is guarantees our inheritance until all of redemption 
takes place. So these blessings are for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord without distinction. What good news. And yet, I also must say that they are only for those who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. So let me ask you this morning, have you repented of your sins and have you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus to be saved? Apart from Christ's work on the cross, paying the penalty from your sins, you are under the judgment of God. You will face the wrath of God. But through the work of Christ on the cross and through his resurrection from the dead, if you call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. And if you have already called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, guess what? You have the mission that was given to the church here in Acts to take the gospel to the ends of the earth so that the nations can hear of the good news of Jesus before judgment comes upon them. And you have the promised Holy Spirit with you. Jesus says, I am with you as you go and declare the gospel. Well, let's now turn to the third blessing of repentance. Those who don't repent will face God's eternal judgment. Now, I admit, this may not seem like a blessing, but this is how it is framed. I will say that it is not a blessing for those who don't repent, but God's judgment on those who do not repent is a blessing for those who do repent. God's blessing on those who do not belong to, I mean, His judgment on those who do not belong to God is a blessing for those who do belong to God. Again, in Deuteronomy 30, God lists the blessings of those who return to the Lord. He says He will restore their fortunes to them. These fortunes involve things like gathering His people back from where they have been scattered in exile. It involves material prosperity, which we've already talked about. It also involves, we're told, a circumcised heart, which I think is referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit that we have just spoken of. But the fortunes of Deuteronomy 30 also include one other thing. They include curses on the enemies of God's people. And so it's no surprise that when God speaks of judgment on the nations in Joel 3, verses 1 and 2, He begins by saying, For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem... I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage, Israel. Let me put it as clearly as I know how. Before God can fully restore the kingdom to His people, before they can dwell in His presence fully, before they can receive all of the promised blessings of the last days, of the eschatological blessings, God must first remove all of the kingdoms of the earth, all of the nations that do not call upon the name of the Lord. In order for unencumbered blessing to flow, all of the enemies of God must be put out of the way. This section on God's eternal judgment is divided into two parts. In the first part, God summons the nations so that He can pronounce a judgment on them. And then in the second part, He summons the nations to battle so that He can execute that judgment upon them. The summons to pronounce a judgment is found in verses 2 to 8. God says in verse 2, I will gather all the nations, so he's summoning them, and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there. The valley of Jehoshaphat may be a literal place, but the meaning of the word is the main thing we need to take away. It simply means the valley of judgment, or the place where God will declare his verdict upon the nation. 
But before he declares his verdict, he first brings charges against the nations and establishes his case against them. They have harmed the people of God, is the simple summary, and they have dishonored God himself. So God pronounces a verdict. He tells us in verse 4 and again in verse 8, I will return payment on your head. In other words, God's judgment will be a just judgment. It will be the just deserts of those who have done harm against the people of God, who have rebelled and dishonored God himself. In verses 9 to 16, God then summons the nations to a battle to execute his judgment. Look at verses 9 to 10. Proclaim this among the nations. Consecrate for war. Stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. So he's drawing all of the people into battle. In verse 14, we see a description. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdrawing their shining. Many preachers throughout the years have used this verse of the valley of decision to call people to make their decision now before the Lord brings His judgment. But that's not quite the way the word decision is being used in this verse. The decision is not the decision of man for God here. The decision being spoken of is God's decision to judge the nations. And that decision is being carried out in these verses. Verse 13 describes God's judgment. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Friends, this is not speaking of material prosperity, of the wine flowing in the way that we've seen it in other parts of the Old Testament. This is a description in very vivid picture of God's coming wrath. We see it in Isaiah 63. We see it very clearly in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 14, we read this, and another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. We see something very similar in Revelation 19 when Jesus returns with the armies of heaven to wage war on the nations. Then I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. This is the picture of God's coming judgment upon the nations of all who do not bow the knee to Christ, repent of their sins, and call upon the name of the Lord. At the final battle, God summons the nations to war, but there was never a question about the outcome. Christ's victory will be swift, and it will be decisive. When that day comes, it will be too late to make a decision 
for Christ. This judgment will also be grounded in God's justice and His righteousness. Those who turn to Christ in faith now are saved by God's justice and His righteousness. But it is through the righteousness of Christ. We are sinners. But God can be just and the justifier of sinners because His justice and judgment have been poured out on Christ on the cross. So if we are in Christ, the justice of God has been served. But if we are not in Christ, if we have not turned to Him, then God's just judgment awaits us on this final day of judgment. And this judgment is described as a blessing for God's people and again, evidence of God's presence among them. Look at verses 16 to 17. The Lord roars from Zion, and He utters His voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to His people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain. The ultimate goal of salvation, to reiterate, is for God to restore His people to dwell within His presence. But before this can happen fully, God has to remove all of His enemies and the enemies of His people. Then and only then can the full blessings come upon God's people. And that's the way that we see the stages progress in Joel chapter 3. So let's turn now to the final blessing. Those who repent will receive God's eternal blessings. So those who don't repent, God's eternal judgment. But for those who do repent, God's eternal blessings. Look at verse 18. And in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and the fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and the water from the valley of Shittim. This picture, this image, is something far more than the temporal material blessings that we read about in the beginning of our passage this morning. This is speaking of eternal blessings. How do I know that? Because the image here of water flowing from the very house of the Lord is imagery that is picked up in Ezekiel, but also in the book of Revelation again. It describes the events. Revelation describes the events that follow the Lord's judgment upon the nations. There are stages to the blessing. It describes the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem that comes down from out of heaven. This is what Revelation 22 says. 1 to 3 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His servant will worship Him. This is the picture of the unencumbered eternal blessings, where there is no longer anything accursed, no more enemies of God mixing in and corrupting the blessings of God. Only the rich blessings of God, where God the Father and the Lamb will be present among His people forever, and the people of God will worship Him forever. This picture is brought into stark relief in verses 19 to 21, which close out our passage. There's a contrast here. Egypt and Edom represent the nations who rebel against God. We are told they will be uninhabited because they've shed innocent blood. 
but Judah will be inhabited forever. He will avenge the blood of his saints, and the Lord will then dwell with his people in Zion forever. Do you see this ultimate goal reiterated again and again? God's blessing is his enduring presence with his people. Revelation 21.3 describes it this way, which is a reiteration of what God had been saying in his covenant promises to his people for centuries and centuries. He says, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Amen. The only way to be saved is to repent of your sin and to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Repentance will cost you. You will forfeit many of the temporal pleasures of this life. But friends, it is worth it. Those who don't repent on the negative side will face the judgment of God, but those who do will receive God's eternal blessings. Blessings that begin now as the Spirit resides within us and all that belongs to Christ is ours, but blessings that we also have to look forward to in the new heavens and the new earth. Judgment is motivation to repent. We downplay it too much in our day. But the blessings, the promises of God that await us in the future are even greater motivation. Motivation to repent today and motivation to follow Jesus to the end of your days. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we pray that you would impress upon our minds not only the real and coming judgment for those who do not repent, but also the rich and eternal blessings for those who do. Help us to be people who long for your presence, who know that a day in your courts is better than thousands elsewhere. Help us to desire that today. Help us to long for that on the final day. And may that help us to persevere in the meantime with great joy, joy that is set before us in Christ. In his name we pray, amen.